Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining our webinar. As previously announced, today we're holding a webinar on social freezing. My name is Mara, and I'm an IVF coordinator at Prague Fertility Center. <laughs> and this is my, um, my dear Nina, and she was our patient previously. I think you did this in August, September, right? We, yeah, we started... Uh... In August. In August, mm -hmm. right. We started in August because mm -hmm. I was on holiday. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and she did this in September. So she is like has fresh memories of the whole process. And she's kindly accepted to come and share her experience with us, which is really important. I honestly think that nobody can tell you better how it goes and how it feels that somebody who actually went through it. So um, what I want to say a little bit at the beginning is a little bit about the female fertility. And for us, like fertility is um, unfair. We are born with all of our eggs and we lose them over time. And moreover, they also accumulate uh, genetic mutations as we age. So for anyone who doesn't have like plans for pregnancy immediately or doesn't have a partner, uh, social freezing is recommended. So I want to ask Nina, because um, the reason why I want to ask her is because we're not always aware of this fertility factor and that there are limitations to it and that we need to think about our future. We sort of like live a life and we see as it goes. Like we all hope for like eventually we're going to have a family, we're going to have children. Well, we don't really look into it to understand when should I do this. <clears throat> it's sort of not trained to us that we need to think a bit more about the planning of it specifically. And life has taken a different turn nowadays, especially, which I'm very, actually, I'm very proud about it. I'm very proud that women are getting more and more, like, educated. Women focus on their careers much more, on their, like, higher education. They also want to do... They want to achieve much more than before, and therefore uh, their plans for pregnancies get delayed. And I, it shouldn't be unfair to them just because they want to do more things and they want to achieve more things that sh they should be deprived of, of becoming a mother or have you know pregnancy. And so social freezing comes to rescue. This is like... This is the thing that can give you like an opportunity or like the freedom to give yourself a little bit of time to do the things that you want to do and at the same time not stress about the fact that time is ticking and you know whatever reason that maybe you haven't met the right partner or because <laughs> it's kind of harder these days <laughs> so whatever reason that is it's always good to to think about yourself and making a plan for yourself so I want to ask Nina a little bit about how she learned about her own fertility that brought her to the decision of freezing her eggs. Mm. So <clears throat> I think like a lot of people, it's not something that we really think about until we get to that window of time where people are a bit more vocal saying, so when are you going to have kids? Are you thinking about starting a family, right? And so I, to be totally honest, right, I didn't really start looking into it until about a couple years ago. Um, and I was aware, right, of kind of IVF, right, and how it works and the kind of struggle that women go through. Yeah. Um, but the freezing part was very new to me. Right. Right. Um, and so I would say I started really taking it a bit more seriously and started doing a bit more research. Uh, I would say the beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. um, and there was actually a podcast that I had listened to, which was called the race to 35. And it was about two women in the States who we're kind of documenting their egg freezing journey, right? Um, before both of them turned 35, because I guess, as we have heard, right, that, you know, from 35 on, it's just kind of downhill. And so um, that, again, kind of sparked this interest of, well, maybe this is something that I should look into, yeah. right? Um, but how old are you, Neha? I, uh, I just turned 34. You just turned 34, yeah. okay. So mm -hmm. when you were, like, 33... 
Mm -hmm. Right, you started looking and thinking about plans. Right? Yeah, it all it all happened very quickly, right? Um, okay. And you know, when I was reading up on a lot of this stuff, people were saying things like the ideal age to freeze your eggs is at twenty seven. I didn't know know anything at twenty seven. Um, I also didn't have two nickels to rub together at 27, so it's, I definitely couldn't afford yeah, it. Yeah, right? this is one of the aspects is, is also like the financial power because yes. you need money to do this, obviously. You yeah. do, and when you're in your 20s, you are probably don't have them. You don't have money. I have don't zero have dollars in the 20s. <laughs> so it's, we're students. We're yeah. barely getting out of like, you know, a university. We're getting our first jobs. How are we going to be able to pay for it? Yeah. It's, it is unfair, this aspect is true. And But I think that once in your like, 30s, mm -hmm. even up to 35, even up to 35, if your financial like capacity allows, yeah, it's this is when you're a little bit more financially stable and you can afford <coughs> to invest into yourself like yeah. this. You're yeah, in your 100%. 20s, you're kind of just making it to the next month. It's yeah. so it's unfair to put this idea into women's head. You got to do it in your 20s. I mean sure if you can if you can, absolutely for sure but yeah. if you can't and if that shouldn't really stress you there's still time until you're 35 definitely even past 35 is possible to be done yeah so this is another another reason why i see a lot of women like nowadays i have a lot of like women who are exactly in the same situation in their 30s mm. i don't think i've had anyone in their 20s who yeah. contacted me yeah. because first of all we are still so immature in our 20s. We're mm. still kids. We're still learning. In your 30s, you become a bit more mature, more mm. aware of life and future and yeah. possibilities. And you think a little bit more. Nowadays, I feel like there's much more like information that is shared and published yeah. about this possibility and inc even encouraging women to you know think about this yeah. rather than regretting it later. Yes. Yeah, that was a big thing for me. Is I really didn't want to regret it further down the line right because I've always been kind of on the fence about having kids right I I'm not sure if I want them I think everybody also goes through a phase of am I even responsible enough to take care of a child but like I've always been on the fence of having kids but I just didn't want to rule it out for me completely mm -hmm. um and also too late and so that's why I okay. essentially decided to do it I think it's mm -hmm. it's you know, for for so many women, yeah. they feel exactly like like you do. Yeah. It's so very hard to embrace motherhood yeah. before you're a mother, or yeah. to like desire that so much in your thirties. You yeah. really enjoy your life, but nowadays we do so much more than our mothers did, or our mm -hmm. grandmothers did. Mm -hmm. We we have a life that you know it was never probably imagined before yeah we travel we we see the world we accomplish so many things we have university degrees mm -hmm. we um we have jobs that are you know fulfilling and and these are a lot of the reasons that women want to freeze their eggs because mm -hmm. it's so it happens that you know um it it starts to become the moment when you are happy in your job mm -hmm. or your your career only starts to take shape yeah. in your 30s not in your 20s in yeah. your 30s you're becoming more confident you're becoming more like uh, uh knowledgeable yeah. you're you have some years behind you your career starts to take a path mm -hmm. but as it happens that is the time when you should also or it would be desirable for you to conceive. Yeah. And so you have to sort of make a choice or give up one for the other. And that is a really tough choice to yeah. make. So this becomes as well like a reason for women to to give themselves that little like break of, of I, I, I can still do what I want right now without mm. having to sacrifice something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what was your reason for doing that? So I guess the one is I didn't want to regret not doing yeah. it, but also I'm at a really good place in my career. Uh, I got a promotion at the end of last year, and so I I thought, okay, well this is great. I'm I'm really gonna fully invest 
time and effort into, you know, being the best possible manager that I can be, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. But I think I just, I'm not in a place right now where I'm ready to make that decision of, okay, I'm ready to settle down and, and have a kid, or I'm ready to settle down, find a partner and have a child, right? Mm-hmm. I just, it's not right now, right? Um but yeah, that's that's probably the biggest reason why. It is, and and it's also like you know, if you find a partner, it's uh, it's kind of hard to um, <clears throat> plan immediately, like uh, parenthood, or yeah. you know, just discuss. Okay, so we met now. You know, my time. I would like to have kids probably within the next six months or one year. I need year. a baby now. I need a baby, <laughs> and it's it's hard because yeah. you you want to get to know someone before like really settling into this and yeah. making sure that you make the right choice of who you are going to have a family this is for the rest of your life for sure yeah. hopefully yeah <laughs> but so you know it's it shouldn't be a choice based on the fact that i'm running out of time yeah. but it should be a choice that is like this is conscious this is making it's you that you i want to have kids but yeah not like yeah 100 <laughs> percent. yeah okay Right, so we talked about like the potential reasons to like have egg freezing to freeze your eggs and and you know i I encourage all the younger women who do have this possibility like from from every aspect from financial aspect from the possibility to travel to Prague or you know because it's great to do it in Prague isn't it? <laughs> uh, a thousand percent it is um I think some of the shocking things that I did start to find out, right, about the process as a whole Mm -hmm. is just how unbelievably expensive it is in the States. States. Um, I haven't lived in the States for 11 years, right? Um, You kind of forget about that. Well, well, yeah. (laughs) About that that aspect. You get used to it. It's so expensive, right? And so... Again, I think that was one of the other things as well that was a big selling point for me. And so it's like, I can definitely afford to do it here. Mm-hmm. I might as well just do it. Right? Yeah. Um, because, I, I mean... It doesn't I'm, bankrupt you. No. It's it's not like you have to sacrifice so much or save for like two years yeah. to do this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not as damageable as it is in the U.S. In the States, in the States yeah. yeah. I mean... For anybody that can afford it in the States at 27, I love that for you. Yeah. I I just imagine myself as a 27-year-old in the States. Um, like I said, didn't have two nickels to rub together. So, um, yeah, that the, the difference in price points is pretty shocking. It is. I speak to a lot of people from, from the U.S. Yeah. Because now we're also like, it's, I think... I don't think it's news to anyone that we are going through like a financial crisis. So this is worldwide. And for this reason, I see a lot of more like requests coming from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Um, Not just on social freezing, but also on like IVF treatments because people are like currently looking into to finding a way to still do what they want to do mm. but in an affordable way yeah. it's uh it's extremely expensive i i have talked to a lot of people on medication <clears throat> it's expensive and ultrasounds are not for free and right. you know it's here is it's such a different system it's like once you become our patient pretty much you can come in every day if you wish yes <laughs> it's, yeah it's like we you're our responsibility so yeah yeah, yeah. so uh i like i i know about the struggles financially in the US with IVF and social freezing as well. Uh, social freezing as well because a lot of the girls find ways now to to do this while they are traveling. Yes. Because they yeah. think that it's like, you know, I'm just I might just like go this summer to Europe. So while I'm in Europe, I've had this like girls that were like, while I'm in Europe and I'm traveling, I'm going to Spain and then guess what? I'm going to make time to come to Prague and while I'm in Prague I'm going to do this yeah and it's like an amazing like it's an amazing plan yeah like, this is going to work and we you know it's like when I talk to these girls I, I'm so excited for them and I'm like okay I'm so excited for you I'm gonna I'm gonna make this work we're yeah. gonna like plan your meds we're gonna like time it correctly so that you come here when is your cycle you get the meds yeah 
so it's 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 really it's really nice to see this i love that there's so much more like um women are becoming so much more encouraged to do this yeah Even, yeah so i think what was interesting right when you were talking about kind of this shift when you get into your 30s I think something that does start to happen is that you also start to prioritize yourself, right? And the things that you want to do, right? I think in, in our 20s, and maybe this is not for everybody, it's for me, but I I prioritize everybody else, right? I wanted everybody else to like me, and I always wanted to do the yeah. life party. And as I got older, I was like, this is not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I've put myself on the back burner for such a long time. Right, so this is super encouraging to hear that women are just like, actually, I'm gonna go to Europe for three months and I'm gonna go travel and have yeah. a great time, but I'm also gonna go do something for me and yeah. a future family, right? Yeah. That's that's so great to hear. Wait that. until your 40s, you will see how. <laughs> I how cannot wait. You, you, <laughs> you don't prioritize my class. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I I agree. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about um, the specifics of yeah. of the social freezing of egg freezing, and you're you're the best at talking about it <laughs> because you went through it. I didn't go through it, so I don't know exactly how yeah. it feels. That's why I have you here. Yeah. Um, what I can like say about it. So the first time you contact us, and we understand that this is what you want to do. First, we're going to, to give you some like instructions or like what are the examinations that we want to see from you in terms of like, first of all, we, we will try to understand a little bit, a bit about your medical past, your medical history, your family history. Uh, we want to make sure that you are healthy and that we will not harm you when we are going to do this. So before anything starts, we make sure that you are okay. Then we want to learn a little bit about your fertility. And by that, I mean, we need to know a little bit about your ovarian reserve. And that means like uh, there's a specific hormone. It's called AMH. And this indicates uh, what is your ovarian reserve, right? So based on this, the IVF specialist is kind of estimates your, your you know, results. And he creates... Um, a protocol, a so-called protocol, which is going to be specifically and tailored for your results. What we are trying to do, is we're trying to make sure that we are going to retrieve the highest amount of eggs, because we don't want you to do this more than once. It wouldn't be like, it's not the end of the world if you do it more than once, but <clears throat> this is we're trying to make you do this just once. If you're going to do it once, then we should retrieve everything possible, but with the minimal risks. So minimal risks, highest amount of eggs possible. The other thing is that uh, what is good to do is an ultrasound, an ultrasound of your ovaries where we can read a little bit about the follicles that are on your ovaries that indicate and gives us an, an idea about the expectations of what can we expect when we retreat. So once you start this, you will know a little bit about the amount of eggs potentially that we could expect from you. So this information is going to be given to you beforehand, at least like Potentially, we can't really be specific about it. So, uh, I want to ask Nina because she contacted us, and I want to ask how was her like first interaction with with us? Mm -hmm. Like, what made her like come back <laughs> in the yeah. first, in the first place? That's right, because I I sent you an email. I want to say like closer towards the end of, of last year. Yeah. Um, and then I just completely left you hanging and you were like, hey, so just checking in. Uh, we'll close your file for now. There's no rush, honestly. And I remember saying, I'm actually in the States at the moment. Uh, and this was around the time that I was going to tell my family that I was doing this. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm in the States at the moment, but I'll send you an email as soon as I get back. And okay. then I sent an email. Um, but prior that, it was just 
super informative from the get-go, right? Um, explaining all of the details that were important for me to know before mm -hmm. I make any sort of decision, okay. uh, which I think is always helpful, right? Yeah. Uh, because once you make this decision, you'll get, right, I'm going to do this, and then you go, okay, so... So now what? <laughs> right. So what am I what supposed am I to do, do now? Like, um, what's, the, what's the next thing that I need to exactly. do? Exactly. Yeah. And I think that you were kind of essential in all of this, right? Just saying, look, okay, so this is what you can expect, right? Um, and uh, we'll need all this information. And yeah, once you get it to us, then we'll schedule your first appointment. So it was great and super informative. And I was trying to find the best time to do it, right? And so... It ended up being that awesome. just recently, yeah. yeah, was the best time. It's Maybe not the best time now that I think back on it because of the things that it clashed with at work. Oh. It, well, the end year evaluation cycle right. was happening at work, oh and God. I chose to do this then. So if I were to do it again, I would do it maybe a little bit earlier. Okay. <laughs> so but, yeah. in your perspective, it's like choose a period of time when it's like not extremely busy at work. Yes. You don't have business trips going on. Or yes. You, you, you know, you need to allocate a bit of time to this as well. Yeah, exactly. You don't need to put your work on hold right. entirely, but you need to be mindful of the fact that you know, you need to, to do some scans, you need to apply medication, you know, yeah. things to consider. Yeah. And then, then what happened? Then you came in for a meeting with Dr. Jonas, mm -hmm. right? He was yeah. a doctor. Yeah. So I met was you. Was I in the meeting? I met you in person for the first time. Okay. Um, and we had a really nice chat outside, so it already kind of put me at ease. And then when I met Dr. Jonas, I felt even better, right? Because he was just so kind, right? And was very open to hearing any questions or doubts or concerns that I had. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did the first ultrasound. Right. Uh, and he gave me kind of an estimate as to what we could potentially pull mm -hmm. um, in the retrieval. Um, and one of the things that he had mentioned which I, I accept full responsibility for this, but um, I have a, a gynecologist at a different office. Right. And I had asked her for an AMH test. Right. Right. And um, in her last check or in my last checkup, she had said that I had PCOS like symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so I shared that with Dr. Yonosh and he was like, Okay, this is this is fine, right? This doesn't necessarily mean that you do have it, but let's do these tests and make sure, right? Uh, did the test, found out I had it. I was a little bit devastated. <laughs> right, because you discovered during this treatment that you do have it, yes, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, which was a whole nother thing that I had to kind of figure Process, out, right? Yeah. Because there is, I think people are starting to get more informed about it, but people still just don't know how to navigate it. Mm -hmm. Um so, yeah, I found that out, but I think leading up to kind of the um, the protocol that was given, right, all of the conversations were super open and transparent, um, and that's because I was fully trusting of the fact that you all kind of know what it is that you're doing, right? Yeah. Um, I also had no idea what I was doing either, so I was really just like, all right, I'm I'm leaning into this 100%. But it's like, I can understand, as, as we were mentioning earlier, that it takes, I can understand from the patient point of view, they come to a clinic they don't know, to people they don't know, to talk about like extremely private things. Yeah. That you, you're not used to talk about it. You just have to let go of mm -hmm. every control you have. You have to trust that these people are doing their job right. Yeah. You there you trust them with your like your own body. Mm. They're giving you the correct shots. Are you like giving yourself in their hands? So it's so important to build this like bridge between the patient and us to make sure that we understand each other, that mm. we trust each other, that we also have to trust you, that you're doing your meds correctly, that yes. you're coming in for the ultrasounds, <laughs> that you're doing the exams we want you to do. So, and you have to let go and rely on us. Mm -hmm. And it's important, like, to clarify everything, to ask all the questions. It doesn't matter if you think that they are not 
bright <laughs> <laughs> or not it doesn't matter yeah. if we we want you to go home and feeling like you know what i feel like i'm in good hands i feel like this is going to go well rather than go home and have fear or worries mm. they you will have them yes. that you can't avoid them but it shouldn't be because of like us as a team or as a clinic or you know how this process is going to go you you know we're women we're always anxious yeah. so, so so it's it's natural but we, we you you just have to come and ask everything and we try to explain everything yeah. you were saying you were making notes in during the I haven't the taken class. notes like that since I was in school and maybe even in school I didn't take notes like that but I just I wanted to make sure that I was really well informed and you know something that you had said about asking these questions I really had to check my ego at the door and just say look even if I feel that these questions aren't bright <laughs> um, I have to ask them because I don't know right yeah. um, and Dr. Jonas would just he answered them yeah. so kindly he is right so which kind. was so. so important to yeah. me Right. Um, and I think it's important when you are going through an incredibly vulnerable process that the people that you are working with are kind. Right. Yeah. And every single person that I had an interaction with here was kind, which made things a lot easier for me. Mm, so I'm so happy to hear yeah. that. You know, it's uh, it's so important for us to know that this is, you know, it helps. You know, yeah. it helps the people that they make them feel more like relaxed and and Dr. Yanash, he's like wonderful. He yeah. has so much patience and he dedicates himself so much to patience and, and he wants things to go well. And, yeah. You know, it's, he's really like, his intentions are so genuine. Yeah. He's like a very genuine person. And I, I, I like so much working with him because yeah. he's so dedicated and I trust like that everything goes well. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then you came in, we gave, we had a protocol, mm -hmm. and then at some point you decided to do this. Yep. You decided on a certain cycle, so it has to start on the beginning or the beginning of the cycle. You have to start on day day two, probably, or day three. Like yeah. You can yeah. start, and you came in and you got your meds. Yeah. Right, and you went home yeah. with your meds, and we told you that yeah. <laughs> you need to apply them every day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how was that? So actually, prior to getting the meds, right, right um, I was tracking my cycle in my app that I have, mm -hmm. um, and it said that my cycle was going to start on a particular date, and so I really banked on that. And then it didn't show up. And it was silly of me to expect it because I have PCOS and yes, my cycles are irregular bad. anyway. Yeah. So I, I really put a lot of pressure on myself to be like, right. this is when it's going to start. And it didn't start that day. Mm -hmm. It didn't start the day after. Mm -hmm. it didn't start the day after that. And I was besides myself. <laughs> like, I was so upset. Um, and I think it was by day five that it hadn't shown up. I was like, all right, I'm going to schedule an appointment. I scheduled an appointment, we did an ultrasound, and Dr. Jonas was like, okay, so you have something called a corpus luteal cyst. Yeah. It's not the end of the world, but we have to wait. And I was so, that whole week, I was so stressed out, right, with this not happening uh, when I wanted it to, um, but also there was stuff that I was dealing with at work that was really stressful. And... Um, as soon as he said the only remedy for this is just time, yeah, it's almost like my body kind of sensed, all right, just I just need to let my body do what it needs to do. And I made a joke saying it would be hilarious if it showed up tomorrow. And he said, sometimes that happens. <laughs> Not kidding, the next day it showed up. And I was like, <laughs> okay, so I, I really just need to relax. Um, yeah. So that's, as, you know. soon as, as soon as I my body relaxed yeah. then my cycle started right and so it was only a few days a few days behind behind but it wasn't behind because it's not well, it's like yeah the body and it's, exactly you know we wanted to work according to our plans because we made a plan we have a yeah. schedule if it doesn't we're we're getting like what's happening like what? uh, upset i was <laughs> upset um but yeah i think this this 
this phrase that you've mentioned a couple times, just letting go, right? And yeah. really fully trusting mm-hmm. the people that you're working with, trusting that your body knows what it needs to do, I when it needs to do it, it needs right? To do, yeah. So that happened. A couple okay. days later, came in, picked up my medication. Right. Um, the first one was injected by the lovely nurses here, which mm-hmm. helped ease things a bit. Um, but then the first, Time I had to do it on my own. Right. I was a little bit nervous. Um, I I knew that the nurse had told me that I needed to put it kind of around my belly button area. Um, but for whatever reason, I second guessed it. I went online. Another source said that you could put it in your behind. I thought, okay, now I'm getting confused. But I I trusted that. I knew what the nurse told me to do, right, yeah. which was near my belly button. So I did that, and then after that, it was, it was fine, right? I, but I, I made sure I stuck to the recommended times. Yeah. I, I, I did not mess around with the schedule at right. all, right? I took this very seriously, and so, you know, even if I was in a call, I would say. I will be right back, and I would turn my camera off on Zoom and give myself my injection. Right? Okay. So, um, I, I wanted to make sure that if I was going to do this, that I was going to do it right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, you did well, <laughs> you did well by doing that. Thank you. <laughs> and was it painful? Did you find it, like, uncomfortable? Or did it, have, did it affect your social life? Yeah. Or... During this time, you had to organize your plans differently or around that. Yeah. And... So there was uh, there was Gono, there was uh, Ganarelix, and then there was Menapure, I yeah. think. Yeah. So Gono is what I started with, yeah. and that was fine. Yeah. Um, there was some slight bruising, okay. but that's totally normal. Mm-hmm. Um, the Ganarelix was introduced a little bit later on, um, and that stung only a tiny bit the first time. Okay. And then the Menapure was a very interesting process because there are two syringes and then you got to break the bottle and at one point I broke the bottle but there was like a tiny piece of glass in there and then I was like I'm injecting glass into my body and all my my eggs and and then there was another time where I spilled some of it and I told Dr. Jonas the next day I was like I spilled some of it and he was like it's fine. <laughs> Relax is fine. Right? I know. But that you, you that go, shot gives you the feeling that you're becoming some sort of a chemist or something. Exactly. Like, oh my God, I'm mixing drugs at home. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah. But it's, I think, again, something that is incredibly important is just be present, right? Mm. Be present when the doctor is speaking to you. Be present when the nurses are showing you what to do. If you don't remember, pull out a notebook and... Uh, you know, ask if you can record anything, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it's not ideal to kind of second guess yourself oh. in this whole process, right? Because it just adds to the already very interesting situation, situation. that you're in, right? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to call and it strange, you go but... And you start like spiraling down on, yeah. on the amount of information that you're not just sure. Is it for me? Am avoid I Google, right, <laughs> yeah. during this time. Um, it's like always like, okay, what the doctor said, what the nurse said, I'm going to follow that. I yeah. don't want to look on Google, I'm going to follow what they said. Yeah, that's so, it's super important, right? And I think you, you, you can potentially freak yourself out if you go on to Google and Reddit and you yeah. start reading yeah. about people's experiences and what went wrong. And this this experience is so personal mm-hmm. to every single person that goes through it. And so, yes, there may be some similarities with another person halfway across the planet, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be exactly like yours. Same. So whatever you see on the internet, maybe take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> It's also like, you know, there should be like a limited amount of people involved in this and, and giving a PI on this. Yes, <laughs> and like, idea. you know, having diagnosis on this, there, there shouldn't yeah. be like more an extended like, circle of people. Because yeah. everybody has, you know, even if there's somebody who like already went through it, like experiences are personal and different. So yeah. it's like yours might be different than someone else's. Yeah, I and I do think that, you know, the people that are sharing their experiences are because 
that they either had to learn the hard way or they, and I think the intention is always very pure, pure right, and yeah. very good. Yeah. Um, but if you read it, just don't think that it's going to apply directly to, to you, you or your situation, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Because that's when you get into kind of the danger zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And did you have any symptoms while you were doing the the treatment? And was it like affecting you emotionally or mm-hmm. physically? So it was um, not as bad as I thought it was going to be uh, emotionally, right? Um, I was a mess before uh, as I kind of walked through it already. And I was not great afterwards. Okay. Um, but during, I was actually okay. Mm-hmm. I really I really assumed it was going to be bad because I know that generally right before my cycle starts that I get super moody and mm-hmm. I cry a lot. Um, but it didn't happen, which I was quite surprised. Uh, I maybe cried a couple of times, right? <laughs> but nothing directly related to this, right? And yeah. when I did feel myself getting either emotional or um, maybe I was a bit too sensitive about something, I had to bring myself back to, okay, your body is going through something incredibly different at yeah. the moment so just know that more than likely this is what it's it is associated, associated with, with right yeah. it's not that I'm crazy or that the world's falling apart well, that it's falling apart but like it's it's fine right and you will get through this mm-hmm. and it's just a very interesting window of time when you're going through this and so just kind of Yeah, just be kind to yourself. It's, that's that's it's super kind of important. important to know. Don't, yeah, don't allow yourself to be sensitive yeah. and allow yourself to like have emotions and cry. That's okay. And if you don't, <laughs> don't stress out about it because there are also women who are like, "Why am I not feeling anything? Yeah. Is this working or not? It's okay. It's okay. You know, yeah. each body and physically. Did you have? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, right, it was only the bruising, um, that yeah. had shown up after a couple of days. And then, um, I did, I did start to feel a bit bloated towards the end, okay. right? Um, yeah. I wasn't working out during this time. Um, I was really careful of that. Mm-hmm. And so I would just go on walks and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but Yeah, I think closer towards the end is when I, I really start to feel a bit more uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, well, it kind of, you, it's expected because there's yes. a lot going on there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Especially in your case, it got quite crowded in there. It was busy. <laughs> it was in busy. both. Yeah. It was busy. <laughs> it was busy. So it's normal to come with some symptoms Yeah, and uh, to feel uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's going to pass, but you're going to feel uncomfortable for a little bit. Yeah. And uh, the question is, so you did this, you did all of this. We did the scans and we decided on the day for egg collection. Mm -hmm. And then how was the experience coming for the egg collection Mm -hmm. during the procedure? And if you have any recommendations for for the specific day of egg collection? Yeah. So the day before, I had cooked myself a couple meals, right? I had made sure that I had my electrolyte powders kind of ready to go. I had stocked up on some protein before, mm-hmm. which was your recommendation as mm-hmm. well. So I made sure that everything was prepared before I left the house. Um, you are well organized. Extremely, you are. right? You are. I used to say this really gets in the way of everything, but with this process, this it helped, helped tremendously, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so I uh, got up just like it was any other regular day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was a little bit nervous on the way here, mm-hmm. right? Um, but signed into reception. I saw you. Uh, which I think already started to kind of calm me down a bit. Yeah. And then I uh, got changed into my little gown and got walked into the room. And, yeah, then it was just kind of a, a waiting game, right? And I think what was interesting to see is, like, uh, uh, you would see a woman kind of walk in and then get wheeled out and just like sleeping so peacefully I was like this is this is wild right like I can't I, I can't believe this is happening yeah. and 
Um, environment, very yeah. unique. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. the way that it's set up, right, it's kind of two beds per room. room. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I guess my roommate <laughs> went in and came out, and then I realized that it was my turn next. So um, uh, one of the nurses said, okay, I'm ready for you. And so that's when I really started to feel my heart in my throat. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know. That, then all of these questions start flooding in, right? Like, what if I don't wake up from the anesthesia? Or what if I feel something during the anesthesia? What if I don't get enough eggs, right? And I really had to silence all of that. It wasn't working. And then I saw Dr. Yonash yeah, and I was like, I was like okay, okay, here. I'm, okay, he's here. Everything's going to be fine. They asked me for my name. Um, and then I sat on the table and that's it. That's and then you woke up in your room. I woke up and I felt amazing but that's only because <laughs> the anesthesia i felt so great um <laughs> just so I happy was a champion. <laughs> I did this. yeah i i just felt kind of spacey right and that was a really nice feeling okay. but then uh yeah i just it felt like i had a really nice nap and then yeah. um uh, and yeah. your flatmate picked you up. Yeah, my flatmate yeah. came to pick me up. And that was something that I, you know, we had talked about earlier is I was a little hesitant about asking someone to come with me, right? Um, because I didn't tell a lot of people that I was going through this. Uh, it was maybe four or five. <laughs> and so I did feel a tiny bit of guilt um, asking my flatmate, but my flatmate was like, yeah, sure. I'll be there to pick you up. And so she was there. I think it's important to have someone that you allow a little bit in this process. Yeah. To, you know, it's it's such a, you're in such a vulnerable state. Yeah. And on that day specifically, I think it's good to have someone that knows about it, that helps you a little bit and picks you up and takes you to the home. And there you can be yourself and yeah. do everything you need yourself. But mm -hmm. I think on that day is important. And it's also important on that day to to get a lot of rest yeah. and drink a lot of fluids yeah. and um, and sleep a lot and nap yes. a lot and yeah. because you know it's important for you to recover from this thing. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I wanted to ask you, how were the following days after yeah. the procedure? So actually one other thing I forgot to mention. Um, in kind of preparation for all this, I bought myself really nice pajamas. I bought myself really nice bed sheets. Like I really wanted this, I wanted the recovery to be really good, right? So I was ready, right? That is so cute. <laughs> to be honest, yeah, it was really important. You really for me. treated yourself with like I'm going to treat myself with really nice Absolutely. recovery days. Absolutely, this was yeah. yeah. And I, you know, one of the other things about the recovery is like. I read online, of course, that people were like, I was fine to work the next day. And I said, I'm, my retrieval was on a Wednesday. Yeah. And I took Thursday and Friday off. Yeah. And I told my manager before, well, and a couple of my peers, uh, that I was going to have a small procedure done uh, and that I'll be back on Friday. And all three of them were like, no, just don't come back. <laughs> Take Thursday and Friday off. And so that support was amazing for me. Um, but the day I got home, mm -hmm. right, I, uh, had fallen asleep, but I was pretty nauseous afterwards, um, yeah. which I think is a pretty common side it's effect from the anesthesia. anesthesia. Yeah. yeah. So that nausea was there for uh, a couple of hours, but I had, as per your recommendation, I started chugging electrolytes mm -hmm. and I also was drinking some protein. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that day evening was fine. The day after I felt kind of sore, right? But I, I literally stayed in bed all day, which was amazing. Um, Friday still felt a bit sore, but Friday evening, I started to feel incredibly sad. Um, I was just overwhelmed with emotion and... The hormones are uh, yes. Like, yeah, it's a withdrawal. And I remember thinking, okay, this is a really strange headspace that I'm in, but I'm just gonna try and sleep it off. 
I woke up on Saturday. I still felt really bad, um, not physically, but just emotionally. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to take myself to lunch. And I ended up bursting into tears in the restaurant, which is, I don't like crying in public at all. So this was very strange for me. And I remember trying to tell myself, this is, this is, pretty normal, right? With this whole process, yeah. it's pretty normal. Uh, and I thought, okay, I'll give it until Monday. On Monday, I still felt a bit teary. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had, uh, there was kind of this fertility support group at work. And so I had posted the question. I shared a little bit about my experience, but then I posted the question, look, I just feel horrible, right? Emotionally, like, is this normal? Every single person said, yeah, this is normal, right? Just give me a couple more days, you're going to be totally fine, right? Someone said, it took me about a week to feel like myself again. And then, um, as was kind of mentioned, you know, your cycle would, well, would start hard. shortly yeah. after. And so I think it was just this massive combo of all of those yeah. things that, yeah. that then, you know, once it started, I started to feel a little bit. A little bit yeah. better. And then I took myself to Portugal. Oh, you did? <laughs> yes. well, God, you. Right afterwards, right? Well, I made sure that I recovered first, but then it was like a couple well, weeks later. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice treat. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. It does. Menstruation does start about like five. I mean, you know, it's very different for everybody, but on average, it starts about like five to seven days yeah. after the procedure is done. And then you start to feel a little more... You can breathe, yes. you know, your hormones are leaving your body, so it takes a bit of time. But I didn't know about this emotional part of oh. the words. I did not know that. You know, it's like yeah. so good that you're telling yeah. us this. Yeah. It's important to be prepared. Yeah. You know, at least I'm going to prepare the next yeah. patient. I'm not just, <laughs> it's you know, a possibility. So you know <laughs> when it's happening. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, we got a question from a live chat. Ooh. Right. Hello. I'd like to know if there are some special way of living, eating, exercising two, three weeks before starting the stimulation and during stimulation. Thank you. Um, well, before starting the stimulation, there isn't really anything indicated specifically. Um, it's just normal life. But during the stimulation, it's always you know, be a bit more mindful. As Nina was saying, you have to be a bit more mindful about the fact that you are going through something. Um, extreme sports are not recommended. Nobody's saying that you should completely stop your daily routines, mm -hmm. but you will feel, you will see, like at, at the end of your like stimulation, you simply won't be able to do the same things that you did normally. It's just your body will like feel bloated and heavy. So it's time to to allow yourself to go through this, and then you will eventually go back to your normal routines and sports and whatever you want to do. In terms of eating. I don't think that there are no there are no special restrictions in in eating. You can eat anything you want. It's not going to impact any in any way. Okay, uh, so thank you so much for sharing this experience with us. Thank it's, you for it's like me. I think I've learned a lot as well from you. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many details I didn't know. Yeah. Though I was here with you through the process, but yeah. I didn't know like you know the emotional part afterwards and yeah. like how what you did at home, which mm. is so adorable. I, and I think it's such a, such a good like advice and plan. You know, it's yeah. like it's like you really focus on yourself. Yeah, right now on you and you're doing these things. So uh, I have like some common questions that I should like I get from patients a lot. Yeah. They're always the, a lot of them. They ask me, so how long can I keep my eggs frozen for? Oh, no, yeah. So mm -hmm. there isn't really a limit to that. The, you know, we can keep them. And by law in the Czech Republic, especially, mm -hmm. we can't really do embryo transfers until you like after you're 49. Yeah. So anything before that, it can be five to 10 years. But it's always you have to be aware of the fact that also your body ages as yeah. well. So, you know, it's great that your eggs are younger mm -hmm. or young, but you should keep in mind about the pregnancy, mm -hmm. having it done later. Right. So, 
Uh, the other thing is, can I move them to my home country? We, oh, since yeah. we have like um, patients that come from outside, they ask us if we can move them. Mm -hmm. That's like absolutely possible. There are like um, special um, couriers that do this, that transfer biological material, and this is easily arranged. The other thing is, uh, what do I do if I find a partner? What am I going to do with the eggs? Yeah. yeah. And so we always recommend them in the first place. You know, it's, you recommend them to, you know, first of all, try to have a kid naturally. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This is, and then if that doesn't work, you are always welcome to the clinic and we can make a plan and discuss how can we help you with the eggs that you have here. Uh, they can always be kept as a as a backup plan for your potentially second child because your eggs are going to be younger mm -hmm. and you're going to have, you know, the chances of having a healthy baby are going to be higher. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, later in life and your second pregnancy becomes like past 40 or so on, it's good to think about this. Um, is this going to diminish my chances of conceiving naturally? No, it's not going to diminish. It's actually uh, it's a good plan to have. Your chances of conceiving naturally are going to be exactly the same. Uh, are there any risks on my health? So, as I said, um, it's one thing that I'm actually quite proud about Czech Republic in the first place. Mm -hmm. Czech Republic is like has an, an excellent mm -hmm. medical care yeah. excellent really excellent, yeah. they are so preventive and they are so careful about the you know every single step they take they won't get into a procedure before they really make sure that you are healthy to do that procedure even you know even the anesthesiologist is going to be so quite demanding in the exams that are needed to yeah. make sure that that anesthesia <clears throat> is not going to do any harm to you so everything is really very carefully done and very preventive. And your safety is kind of like really the first thing that we have in mind is like we need to make sure that you leave this place in good in good shape and you're safe. It's not going to affect your health. There are some risks uh, that can appear during the stimulation, but the good thing is that you are going to be here during your stimulations and it can be reacted on the spot. Our doctors are here. They can react to, to whatever, whatever is happening. You can come in every day. You can have multiple checkups and if anything, there is somebody who can like take care of you. Okay, we have another questions from live chat. Is, int is intimacy allowed before and during stimulation? Uh, it is allowed before. Uh, at some point, it's it's not prohibited. It's not like it's it's again. At some point, you might feel some discomfort having doing like you know intercourse. It's not going to be the best intimacy you've had. So it's it's not. Uh, <laughs> yes. I don't know if you want. <laughs> that point of yeah i'm not sure it's something you will desire it's allowed of course uh after is also not recommended at least until your first cycle comes is not recommended your ovaries are going to be swollen they're going to be like enlarged so no after is definitely not recommended at least until your your menstruation starts okay how about the hormone levels after the procedure? Do they adjust quickly after the procedure? And I'm interested if the AMH levels drop after the oocytes are taken. Well, it really depends. I think this is a question that I would like to check with one of our doctors because I'm probably not in the best position to answer it and I don't want to say something that might not be correct. So if you don't mind, I am going to get back to you and I'm going to check with my with the IVF specialist I'm actually going to leave my email address and you can email me your question directly and I'm going to take you to the IVF specialist so which is a better it's a better plan okay how much is this going to cost me oh cost <laughs> I think we talked about it that it's it's affordable here versus the US I don't know where you guys are from it depends. In some parts of the world, it's more expensive. In some parts of the world, it's affordable. In in the Czech Republic, for patients coming from the from outside, 
the cost is 3,100 euros and it includes storage for three years. So you're covered for three years. Uh, is Prague safe? Yes. Nina okay. can tell us been she's been living here years. for like 11 years. She's like, she <laughs> can be like yeah, an ambassador of like Prague. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I would be the best at that, but no, I, it's incredibly safe. Um, I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say. It's, just really, <laughs> it's really safe here. I, I'm incredibly comfortable here. Um, yeah. It's, it's, you know, the reason why I get this question is sometimes I'm a little bit surprised by the fact that there are some people coming from like far away yeah. and they're still having this idea of Prague being or Czech Republic being a post communistic country yeah. and they're like are a bit skeptical about the level of technology that we have the, yeah. uh, how advanced is the medicine they have this vision of like we're still quite backwards and it in a little bit like it amuses me because yeah. I have been living here for so long and yeah. you've been living here for so long and we know how like, like how advanced everything is right. medical care is great and yeah Prague is like one of the safest cities in the world in the world yes yeah. it's it's hardly ever you hear about like criminality here like yeah this. yeah so. i think one of the other really interesting things um if we're kind of on the topic of motherhood and having kids um the czech republic does a really good job at prioritizing new moms right um, yes. all my friends that have become moms just have had the best experience here right and even when it comes to maternity leave and you know the funding that you get from the state like it's it's amazing um it is so. it is and i'm very grateful for it to yeah. be honest. i'm very grateful for this system and i'm very grateful how like careful they are how you know how well like people are treated and how you know they they look into into every single detail and they won't they wouldn't really like suggest anything unless they make sure that they can do that or the patient is safe. Yeah. And this safety that we see it in the city mm -hmm. is reflected in, in many aspects of, of the country, like the medical care, the education. You know, children are safe in schools and, and mm -hmm. so it's 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 a it's a it's a great feeling to have to live in a place where you don't feel in danger mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we talked about how advanced is Czech Republic in reproductive medicine. Actually, Czech Republic is kind of like one of the leading countries mm -hmm. in, in reproductive medicine worldwide. So it has kind of a long history in, in IVF. Yeah. And, and so it is quite advanced. But we do have some questions from before, which I would like to answer. Would you recommend a three-month fertility diet to improve the egg quality prior to the procedure? If you can, this is definitely not going to hurt. It's only going to be good. There's never anything bad in doing a, a fertility diet. It's If you can allow those three months for doing that, yes, absolutely do it. But it's not absolutely necessary. It's um, unless there's some indication for it, and there's something that we would want to suggest. Um, if you are in the somehow you are you want to do this sooner rather than later, and you want to focus on actually getting it done rather than waiting, then it's not necessary. You can do it, you know, at your next menstrual cycle, and you don't have to wait the three months. Is the procedure advancing your menopause? The fat you boost hormones to produce more mature oocytes. No, the, produce, the, the procedure is not advancing your menopause. Your menopause is set and you will have it at the same age that you were supposed to have it, either if you do this or not. These eggs you were going to lose otherwise and you just collected them and you saved them for yourself. It's not going to advance your menopause in any way. And menopause in most of the cases is genetic and it's preset already as you are born. It's not something we can control or advance it or, or uh, delay it in any form. Okay, is the procedure advanced? Oh, sorry. Do you recommend social freezing for someone who has turned 40 with good AMH level? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, 
what can I say? It's, it's, let's go by the principle, it's better to have something frozen rather than nothing. With a good AMH level at the age of 40, yes, have it done, do it. It's better 40 than 42 or 43. Uh, it might be, you might need to know that at the age of 40, the you know genetic mutations that happen in all sides are like higher. So we would need more eggs probably from you to make sure that you are actually have a chance to, to use these eggs and conceive a healthy child. So it might be necessary for you not to, to do this maybe more than once to make sure that you have a good amount of eggs. But if you feel confident, for example, that if we retrieve from you like 10, 12 eggs, and you feel confident that this is a good backup plan, have it done, why not? Okay, so I think we are we are like coming to an end because we could talk for like two more hours, Nina, for sure. <laughs> about Prague and about <laughs> IVF and about social freezing and dating and yeah. finding, finding partners. Uh, but we are like coming to an end and I am so grateful to you, Nina, that you have taken the time to join us and to come here and to, you know, be so honest about this whole thing. Yeah. Like, I think it's, it's just so important that you're so genuine and so authentic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, we can all learn from you. <laughs> we can all learn <laughs> how organized you are and how well you prepared for this and how you gave yourself this sort of like you invested in yourself and that advice of like focusing on you yeah. uh, and not prioritizing someone else yeah. or it's, it, I think it's such a valuable piece of advice that we can all take. It yeah. doesn't matter even in the plans that we have, just, yeah. yeah. It's incredibly important. I, I think, you know, even if you're not used to putting yourself first, I would recommend that if you decide to do this, I think you should actually just put yourself first, right? And so I think it yes. It should it, it should, should be like that anyway. Like that, yes. <laughs> but this can be the start of you yes. prioritizing yeah. Yeah. yourself, right? And yeah. I think, you know, if you do have a partner, I think it would be important to have that conversation with them, right? Yes. And say, look, I'm gonna have to prioritize myself during this time and I need all the support that I can get from you. And, I know. and hopefully, you know, your partner's understanding yes i'm supportive yeah and, and you know it's i i think i've had women who are they do have a partner and they came to us with the idea that they want to freeze their eggs yeah because they were not ready to like have children or they were not ready to, to become mothers yet mm -hmm. and we but then they became our patients as a couple later on yeah but these these eggs we we wanted to keep them for her yeah, yeah, because you never really know what happens in life. And right. we said, we said to to the patient, we were like, you know, keep this for yourself. Yeah, have them as your backup plan. Mm -hmm. You did them on your own, like time and effort and so on. Right. You can obviously, you know, conceive. You will have that, but this is your backup plan. And it, I think it's so important to give this explanation to women and mm -hmm. this idea because they will like you know, sleep on it, they will think about it. Because we often don't really, there are some thoughts that just simply don't cross our mind. Yeah. And it's important to have somebody with the knowledge and with the experience and seeing a multitude of cases and life stories yeah. to say, hey, keep this for yourself. Yeah. For maybe later, you never know. Yeah. Okay. So, um, oh, one more question from, is there a possibility to save money? Oh. oh, I don't think that's a possibility to save money by selling some eggs to research. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't think, at least not in our clinic, maybe there are some centers who would be happy to help, but in our center, not. Sorry. Okay. So I wanted to, to thank everybody who, who, who was part of this webinar and who took the time to join us and if you have questions that you didn't feel comfortable sharing and you didn't com feel comfortable like asking now, uh, I will like share my email, my personal like work email. And if you want to ask something, feel free to reach me. Uh, my email is corfadio at pragivf.cz. 
I'm not sure if this can be like typed anywhere. Maybe, yes, <laughs> I'm not good at technical part, <laughs> but it's, maybe it's possible. So I'm happy to answer any questions or like to, you know, help you understand a bit more about your fertility or if you have any like issues, feel free to reach me. Anyway, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for having me. It was really lovely. I'm going to say goodbye night, good night, and I hope to see you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you.